Thank you very much, Mohammed. You can uh, you can tell that that was really from the heart and uh, a real great example of what we're talking about today. So, you know, I think it uh, we started with the the opportunity, the enablers, and and then we heard some great great examples of of why we're here and what uh, what we're doing to uh, invest in in Saudi Arabia. So, I think I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, because I think we have a great opportunity here to, to have a further discussion and dialogue with you on this subject. You guys want me to screen these, or should I just read them out? Who will answer? Got the answer? Will answer? Okay. So, what types of uh, emerging technologies are being used, particularly in the oil and gas industry, and what types of opportunities does this present to small business? I guess uh, I'm not a technology guy, but uh, if I'm gonna uh, highlight some areas that uh, are gonna require some uh, quite a bit of R&D and maybe some uh, technology acquisitions and uh, JVs, that's in the unconventional gas area. Um, uh, this is a new uh, high growth uh, business for Saudi Aramco. It's located uh, in the north of Saudi Arabia, north of Ha'il. And uh, um, of course, in the middle of Saudi Arabia, there's no water. So the unconventional gas business, as you know, takes a lot of what they call hydraulic uh, fracturing, uh, and uh, which uses a lot of water. So that's, that's an area of uh, R&D or high-tech need that we will have. Um, the other area, I guess, in the, in the west of Saudi Arabia, where exploration activities are going into the deep water area. So in the past 70 years, we've had it easy, where you know, the, the depths of the wells, uh, um, the production uh, capabilities of the wells have been very good, but now things are getting harder, either in the unconventional gas area or in the deep water area. So those are two things that I can think of right now that really need some uh, high tech and R and D. Thank you. Okay, I guess in the oil and gas, I mean, uh, technology has always been evolving. Yani uh, Khalid mentioned something in the drilling. Uh, they talk about hydraulic fracturing as far as uh, you know, uh, getting a, a, a new method of uh, uh, technology, as a matter of fact, yeah, I mean, as far as drilling operations. Definitely in, in the seismic operations, we definitely use, uh, leverage a lot of technology in our uh, exploration, as well as uh, we'll talk about reservoir simulations. Uh, we have a huge uh, research and development really center in Saudi Aramco. Uh, that actually deals with all aspects of oil and gas. Yani we definitely use our uh, research and development center, but really pertaining to, uh, to our core business, basically the oil and gas business. Uh, I know uh, definitely there's a lot of push as far as uh, research and development in trying to introduce even new products. Uh, if we talk about the equipment manufacturing, I know GE, uh, we have uh, actually a place uh, in conjunction with uh, King Fahad University, one of our premier universities. We have a place called Bahran Techno Valley, where almost all the suppliers, like Yekegawa, uh, which is actually, we're talking about distributed control centers, uh, talking about transmitters. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of technological investments in, the, in that field as well. So anything in pertaining to talk about product, uh, product uh, development as far as metallurgy, uh, mechanical drives, ball valves, uh, new product lines that actually would fit 
uh, our uh, crude oil type because you know our crude oil type is highly corrosive. So we always look for better material as far as equipment even. So there's going to be a lot of uh, development as far as research uh, and development in those areas as well. Thank you. So there's a question here that came in on Dahran Techno Valley. So what, what facilities are in place? I think you, you've talked about that. Uh, who are the current tenants? What support for companies locating there? Okay, the, um, currently, I think uh, the Dahran Techno Valley has, uh, at least in the, the phase one that I know of, I think there's something like 30 lots um, that are available, and I think there's 16 that have been uh, taken already. So there's the, all the up upstream players are there, Slumberger, Halliburton, Baker, um, Weatherford. You know, once one company comes in, all the rest pretty much follow. We took a lot. So yeah. GE came and then Siemens <laughs> followed them. So <laughs> they moved first. All the control system uh, suppliers, Honeywell, Yokogawa, etc. There's some petrochemical uh, companies there. Now, um, in terms of uh, support, I mean, it's pretty much, uh, you know, being close to a university with a lot of good graduating students with uh, a lot of uh, technology and patents coming out is one advantage uh, of being there. Being close to the, uh, the industry, the big industry players, Saudi Aramco, Sabic, uh, SEC, and so on, is another advantage of being there. Uh, there's no subsidies or anything uh, that are given. Um, it's uh, purely on a commercial basis. And uh, I think, uh, you know, like uh, Joe said and Mr. Ravi said, uh, you know, it's just you have to be there now doing r and not just selling products, but you have to be there doing R&D and supporting your customer, being very close to them and innovating uh, as, uh, as the need requires. What kind of uh, premium do you put on companies localizing and using Saudi nationals to staff the workforce? We don't have a set premium. Uh, it runs like uh, as open as it could be, is up to 10%. Yeah. As far as price uh, difference between uh, importing it and, and uh, manufacturing it. So it goes hand in hand. Uh, we say up to 10% because uh, <clears throat> part of it is it goes into the local content and it goes as a percentage of solidizations. So, uh, and we're talking about effective solidization not just the numbers, uh, we're looking at even job titles uh, as far as being Saudis. Okay. There was quite a few questions based on that, so I'm going to skip those. Um, there was a question about who do they contact um, when you say, come, come talk to us. So who, who should they come to? I mean, we have uh, an organization. It's all in the book. Uh, you know, it's, uh, we have uh, a web is a link, uh, Saudi uh, Sagia, which is the Saudi Arabian government, what do you call it, investment uh, agency. Uh, they have a link as well. We have all the material. Uh, we don't need middle people, honestly. We, uh, as far as Saudi Aramco concerned, would like to deal directly with uh, the suppliers. So we don't require any middle people. We don't uh, require any agents. We are very accessible. Uh, as, as Joe puts it, and Khalid puts it, and uh, you could, uh, we work 24-7 as the oil operation does. So we are accessible, and it's all in the, in the CD and in the handbook. As a matter of fact, Saudi Aramco, uh, we have Aramco Services Company. Uh, we have uh, representatives from there that solely for, could be contacted, and they will uh, give you the helping hand. So. You could co call us directly on, on uh, by emails and phone numbers. We'll be more than happy to answer. So again, we are very accessible. Uh, deal with us directly. That. No middle people, no agents. Just deal with us directly. Thank you. There's a lot more here for you guys, but I'm going to give you a rest for a minute here. Uh, <laughs> so 
Um, Carry on. <laughs> so what types of products, uh, opportunities does Sadara see uh, in the kingdom and particularly around renewable energy? And what are the industrial policies that are helping create these opportunities? Um, to start off, I think um, um, we do have this um, concept of um, value power, as we call that, um, and the industry is calling that the conversion park, and, and Dow has experience with those conversion parks in, I think, 50 uh, sites around the world. Uh, what we do there is um, uh, we invite um, people uh, who are interested in working together with us. Either they take um, products and raw material, what we produce from the project, in this case, Sadara, and turn it into something else, um, and Dow and Saudi Arango and the project, <coughs> and Sadara project, will try to provide um, utilities and uh, good connections and infrastructures so um, people coming in will be uh, will have less burden of what we were called um, OSBL um, burden to their project. Now they can do that in both uh, ways and can try to join venture with Sadara if that makes sense to Sadara, or they could could do that on uh, uh, on their own. Um, and I, I cannot really uh, name specifics. I think uh, really if you are interested um, and come to us, talk to us, and we can talk about um, how we are going to set up um, um, businesses um, in, in the conversion park. And the other thing I think I would like to mention is that um, it's not only about putting assets on the ground, it's also about services, and it's very important. Um, Sudara as a $20 billion um, project is going to need a lot of help. Um, and, and we are um, and putting an organization together to do the project itself. But on the other hand, we are also going to need people who are expert in other things other than what Dow and Saudi Aram goes are, are good in. Uh, things like uh, maybe solid handling, I, I can talk on one of those, um, transportation and all the other things. And those are the things that people can provide service to Sadara project itself. Uh, and that would be great opportunity for, uh, uh, for cooperation. Thanks, Donald. There's also another question here for you on what, 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 what stage are you at in Sadara in terms of the design uh, of the project? Um, we um, have um, the board, we had board approval uh, of the project for forming the joint venture in um, July this year, and we signed the uh, shareholders agreement in October, in actually in, in Dakarang, in the kingdom. And as a matter of fact, as we speak right now, the first board meeting, the Sadara board meeting, is being held in Houston, Texas. And actually, I should be there, but they told me, go over there. We don't, we don't need you there go over there in uh, Atlanta, and so that's why I'm here. Um, so uh, in terms of projects itself, um, I would say um, we, we have two parallel tracks here. One is the, the hardware, as I call it, the project uh, itself. We are in the process of awarding uh, EPC contracts, uh, and the bids went out a long time ago, and we have been receiving them uh, in the process. And, and, and the bids are going back to the bidders right now. So um, the, um, um, we are very late, very late. We are almost completing our uh, EPC contracts right now. Um, so the other part of the business, uh, what I would call is the soft part of that, is setting up the joint venture itself and get people trained. Uh, we are in the process of hiring people. Um, I mean, one of the busiest person in the team is the HR director. And just imagine that uh, you are going to have people uh, in the project and hiring um, trainees um, from the market, both inside and outside the kingdom. Uh, and we are doing that a lot here in US as well. And also um, trying to identify people with our DAO organization and sending the, and, and as a seconded into the, in the Sadara organization and 
backfill them, right, in our own organization. And I mean, um, the HR director is really screaming for help right now. And, and so the project is in full swing, let me put it that way. And we are trying to spend money and also we're trying to find money at this point in time and trying to get money from the, the ECAs, the commercial uh, the lenders. Uh, and at the same time, spending big money right now. Uh, spending 20 billion is is a not easy job. <laughs> okay, we'll uh, we'll shift back to to uh, Aramco. So, will the uh, buying trends uh, be for a corporate procurement agreements uh, or b competitive bidding? How does it? I think the question is how, how does it how do you differ the two? You know, as uh, as more puts it, what we're looking for is more into the CPA, which is a corporate procurement agreements, really, that carries a lot that has uh, parts manufacturing, uh, supply of equipment, parts manufacturing uh, services. Uh, we are for the long haul, really, when we talk about the investment in Saudi Arabia. Uh, we offer both, uh, you know, uh, people. Sometimes they offer competitive prices and bidding, but really our aim, as I put it, is actually setting up local manufacturing. It does make business sense for us. Uh, we are in the oil business, and oil commodity is strategic to us, and uh, we have strategic uh, commodities that supports the oil co uh, company or the oil operations that would love to have it inside Arabia, it does make sense. Uh, we have a great emphasis in trying to shorten the supply chain. Uh, we do it, and other company does it as well. So we are all for the long haul. We, we, we have a lot of uh, CPAs. A uh, good example is with ITP Gold. We have a corporate procurement agreement that covers uh, all aspects. Uh, the same with GE and other companies, uh, Siemens as well. But we're talking about the whole thing and for the long haul. There's, there's a lot of questions, uh, I, think, I think you've touched on it already, but uh, around can Saudi Aramco help connect foreign companies with local suppliers uh, to support the localization of the supply goals that you have in the kingdom? Uh, definitely, I mean, that's, uh, that's a major part of uh, new business development role. Um, you know, I have to admit that when you come, uh, it's difficult to find information. I mean, I have examples. Uh, maybe there's somebody here from FlowServe where um, they were importing castings from China when next door to them uh, in Dammam Industrial City was the one of the best in the world. Saudi company there. So connecting the dots, connecting everybody together is part of our role. Um, uh, now, if somebody asks, who should be my uh, partner in terms of investing, that's something that we, we will not give a recommendation on. But uh, in terms of who's there uh, in the supply chain that you could use and to make you even more competitive, that's where we come in. <coughs> I, I just want to add, like when people look at trying to invest in Saudi Arabia, I usually tell them it's not just Saudi Arabia. We're looking about, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, Arabia is the oil center, is the oil hub, but there's a lot of uh, other businesses too. We're talking about, uh, you know, Kuwait, we're talking about all the GCC. So I know of people that actually set up manufacturing facilities in Saudi Arabia, but at the same time they're supplying all the, uh, you know, uh, the other markets as well. I know of people that set up manufacturing and now they're exporting uh, to India, for instance. So really, the global is uh, the globe is is becoming just one small village. Uh, I know that we uh, we have set up an OCTG, which is we talk about the casing and tubing for drilling. And the first order that the Saudi manufacturer got is an order to the states. Uh, so that's that's the whole issue. Is uh, people definitely, as far as Saudi Aramco, uh, yeah, I mean, supply chain is a two way. We're not looking at it as only one way <clears throat> for the investors should, should come and look at, at it as a hub and actually could manufacturing and sell to the rest of the world. Uh, Saudi Ramco is one of them. 
uh, the other neighboring countries as well, and as far as China and India as well. So the market is really, those are the investment opportunities. Uh, China and India are emerging markets. Demands are very strong, as well as Saudi Arabia. So uh, those are the investment opportunities. You locate in Saudi Arabia, and then you access the rest uh, of the region. Thank you. I think this one's for you, uh, Khaled. The, uh, are there any investment guarantee schemes in Saudi Arabia? I think you touched on that in your presentation. I think, you know, there's no guarantee anywhere in the world. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, know you, used to, you used to think governments were safe, and now they are not. Um, uh, I guess, um, you know, when you look at the, the historical trends, maybe that's the best way to look at it. You look at the historical trends of the Saudi market, the regional market, what it has done and how much it has spent. And you can easily project that out and feel confident that the market is there. Um, so, I mean, nobody gives guarantees, but we can tell you that the, the, the future of the oil and gas business will be in the Middle East and specifically Saudi Arabia. I can attest to that. So, you, and you were just talking a little bit about it. Our, our facility, the decision that we took, uh, it's one of one of five global facilities. It, the one that we we put in Saudi Arabia is actually our biggest uh, gas turbine repair facility in the world. And um, the second phase that we announced in terms of our investments, a, a lot of that is going to be only done in the kingdom and will be uh, supplying globally out of there. So currently, some of our repair work that we do on our gas turbine fleet that's global um, comes into that facility and then goes out, supports Europe uh, and parts of Asia. So, you know, it's, it's just when you make the business decision, that's, that's pretty much how it works. Um, Dr. Chen, so what increase in acrylic acid will there be from Sadara, and can we expect how much will stay in the kingdom? Um, a very pointed question. Um, the answer, short answer is I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think um, the, in the, um, the aim that we um, had the, um, at the point in time that we reviewed the project by the end of 2009 and, and early 2010, um, we have uh, come up with a project mix, product mix, which we believe is unique to the kingdom. Um, and we, I think, if you look into the the, 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 uh, the list of Sadara and what we are going to produce, um, and none of them is being produced right now in the kingdom. Now, it doesn't say then that all of them will be consumed in the kingdom. Um, but uh, it does say to me that some of them will be converted uh, locally um, and, and contribute to the, uh, the vision that um, the, the, the Saudi um, government has for them in, in setting up um, and more downstream industries and convert and building up, um, for instance, automotives and, and all the other high-tech industries. So, uh, in a nutshell, I think um, the product mix we are setting up, we are putting up, is is excellent, um, both for Dow Chemical Company, for um, Saudi Aramco, and to be able to offer a broader um, product mix, and also for the kingdom and to either convert locally um, in a big way or uh, export into the the market that we are aiming for. Thank you. Will the buying trends uh, be smaller separate packages or large, more integrated packages for a lot of the investment opportunities coming forward? Small package or? Large integrated packages. <laughs> Both. <laughs> <laughs> No, 
I mean, a simple answer is both, really. Yeah. Uh, you know, we'll talk about the mix, really. So. Yeah. Okay, so does Ramco favor large business groups over smaller companies, and is it difficult to register as a <coughs> vendor if you're a small company? Uh, not really, on the contrary. And, and, and basically, when, we, uh, when I was talking about cluster, really, uh, we're talking about uh, small and medium businesses that actually support the local manufacturing. If we're trying to set up a clusters uh, of local manufacturers, then you need the small and medium services that actually support the local manufacturing. Uh, so we support both. We support the local manufacturing and all the ancillary supports that actually support the, uh, the local manufacturing. We are all for the small and medium because we tend to believe for hotly those small and medium businesses actually create the jobs, not the local manufacturing. And especially on the uh, services side as well. So definitely yes, uh, the emphasis is small and medium businesses as well as the uh, large ones. So it's a mix. But definitely uh, small and medium is part of our emphasis. Uh, I just wanted to add for your information that Saudi Ramco recently uh, created and launched a uh, what's called the Saudi Aramco Entrepreneurial Center. And the name of it now is Wa'id, which uh, in Arabic means uh, promising. promising. Yes. Um, that uh, center is not limited to oil and gas, and it's not limited to Saudis. So in an effort to promote the small, medium enterprises, uh, uh, that is available. So let's say a, uh, a small entrepreneur or a small company from the US that would like to partner with a entrepreneur or a small company in Saudi Arabia, that's fine. And they can approach myself or they can approach the center directly and uh, the Saudi Aramco will also, or Wa'ad will also provide debt financing up to a certain limit, and it will uh, hopefully announce in the near future even equity financing. So again, uh, that, that's proof that we don't, we, we, we don't just favor big companies. I think I'll, uh, this question could be both for, uh, for Donald or Mohammed on, you know, the. The sector demands increased skilled talent uh, to grow the, the, t the talent pool. Um, what programs uh, are, you, are you capitalizing on to do that? Great question. <clears throat> As I mentioned in the previous presentation, um, a good effort by any organization locally towards training of the employees is probably one of the top activities the company has to undertake. And that's training not just for the local uh, nationals, but also for the uh, nationals from other countries. Uh, when you go there, you start from, from scratch, and you have to build it up based on your standards, your work processes, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, in order to develop a very strong, good local uh, recruiting process, you have, you have uh, available, and, and Saudi Aramco helped us quite a bit in that respect, a number of programs. One, universities. You can start co-op programs like we do here in the US. There are plenty of co-op programs and plenty of students that you can take over the summer or holidays and get them into a work, uh, to work in your facility. There are also technical institutes uh, that are developing engineers that uh, you can go and, and recruit from. And um, you know, the, the other thing you can do is, is uh, to try to support um, engineers that uh, don't have the opportunity to finish school towards finishing school and giving them an opportunity to work and go to school at the same time. So in that respect, there are really a lot of, uh, a lot of opportunities um, as uh, Mr. Rafi said earlier, 30% of the population, or 40% of the population is less than 30 years old. So there is plenty of uh, human resources available. And all different categories of work 
workforce. So you have to categorize that. You have to be smart about it when you hire for what positions and what training and so on and so forth. And it's a, a nonstop effort. It's a continuous effort. This is interesting. I, um, I certainly sub subscribe to everything you say, Mo. Uh, I think it's exactly that. Uh, we are doing right now. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Sadara organization right now and going into certainly the institution you're talking about and try to find people. And uh, I would say we are finding good people. And that is not the issue. And uh, we also uh, are uh, looking abroad indeed in the US. Uh, and Saudi Arabia as a country has a big program, an excellent program in sponsoring people outside of the country. Studying, I, I even met Saudi students in China and, and excellent people, top-notch students. Now, on top of that, what, what I would like to say, Mo, is uh, throw your own training program at them as well. Uh, and uh, we, that is exactly what we are doing right now. And we are hiring people um, and pluck them out of the, uh, of the, uh, the colleges and some uh, sometime. And we, we have little people with a little bit of experience. We send them to Dow Science. Uh, and, and ask them, uh, well, and give them a real job, on-the-job training, and, and from the scratch, um, from uh, opening the valve and, and touching the, uh, the control screen and everything that I had to do when I was a young engineer, that they are doing that right now, which is great. Uh, and, and combine, I think, the combination of uh, good education and on-the-job training that the big companies like us are offering and that, that will make a fly. There's a few questions around process laws. I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it uh, for, for any of the gentlemen here to address, but questions around uh, IP laws and protection in your agreements. Um, and Doing business in China has the bamboo curtain. Is there is there anything similar in Saudi? Can you compare and contrast? Yeah. <laughs> uh, as the only Chinese on the panel, probably I would take that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, interestingly, um, uh, Joe, you said in the introduction that I've been sitting on the steering committee of mega projects in China, um, and then. I was plugged into um, from Chinese organ Dao Chinese organization and, and onto this project here, so I do have some comparison of business practices. Uh, I would like to mention two things here. Uh, one is about the duration of a mega project, from the first contact for to signing uh, of the shareholders agreement and basically concluding the project. Now, in China, the statistic shows uh, for a mega project, and then I'm talking about 100 million plus, uh, not even billions, 100 million plus, uh, it takes on average 10 to 15 years to conclude that from scratch, right, to conclusion. Now, I just mentioned um, when the first conception and the MOU signing of uh, RTIP, Restonura Integrate the Project to Satara, that was in May 2007, and we, are, and we have signed the shareholders agreement in October 2011. So it's four and a half years. Now, you can say it is difficult in Saudi Arabia. Yes, there are challenges, but um, just compare those two numbers. Four and a half years compared to 10 to 15 years. And we are talking about a mega, mega, mega project here now, Sadara <coughs> being 20 billion plus with the value part built onto it. So I'm not complaining. <laughs> um, I would say not bad Saudi Aramco and not bad Kingdom. Excellent. So that's one thing, one reference point. The other one <coughs> being the um, Jubel Industrial City. Now, to do a project uh, of this scale, uh, you are indeed setting up a city. Um, and then, um, with the, the conversations I had with um, the Royal Commission about um, support and one-stop shop, and 
how we can work together to build things and uh, infrastructure and all that kind of things. I must say, um, yes, there are times uh, they, we have a um, heated debate about how we do things, but in general, excellent support from Royal Commission. I st I'm still live in China, in Beijing. I still have contacts with the, the mega project people on the other side, on the Chinese side. And I very often say, say to them, if you want to know how to um, provide support, if you want to know how to um, the facilitate a mega project, go to Jubel. Go to Jubel, talk to them, and learn from them how to set up infrastructure, infrastructure and attract foreigners. I know the Chinese are doing great. I'm Chinese myself. Uh, the economy is growing phenomenal at phenomenal speed, but there are things they can learn from Saudi Arabia, and this is one of them. Great. So let me bring it back to Saudi Arabia and uh, and uh, the end of this session. So I think we're we're just approaching uh, 5:30 here, and I think Munir had it the summary best on his on his charts on the why, the how, and and I think you heard great examples of how, and I guess the last the last piece of it is the timing of it, which is now. So, with that, I'd like to thank the uh, the panelists and thank the audience for for the great uh, questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.